a presentation of TFNN. The Tom O'Brien Show is produced every business day. Tom takes your phone calls toll-free at 1-877-927-6648. Internationally at 727-873-7618. Hey, Robert, how you doing, man? Yes, good, and thank you for taking my call. I wanted to let you know that I've been a subscriber for a couple of years, just different members of your team, and I really enjoy it. But really the reason I'm calling is to express my sincerest gratitude for you providing that information information yesterday on the small business grant. I'm a small business owner and primary breadwinner for my family. And if I can get that money, it's going to really mean a lot to my family. So that's awesome. Thank you for uh, taking the time to do that. No, well, well, listen, man, we appreciate you growling and proud with us. Now, Tom O'Brien. <laughs> what is going on, Tigers? This is Jacob filling in for Tom. Let's do a little card room right now. So in love, there are no conditions. You love for no reason with no justification. You are free to be what you are, and you allow others to be what they are. And again, that's a beautiful thing, guys. All right, so the market gone off to a rough start today. We're kind of crawling back uh, in the Dow, um, in the S&P, the NDX. Today, um, obviously, the, the big talk um, are around the banks. There's a lot of interesting things going on. We'll do just a quick recap of what happened with SVB and if there's maybe some other kind of toxic things um, within bank compositions. Um, we'll talk about uh, the potential for steel uh, to be pretty good in the future here um, and just some like minor adjustments going on um, <clears throat> a large company. So, you know, to begin, we can look at um, Walmart here has laid off quite a few of their employees. Um, Walmart's uh, shrinking their e-commerce facilities across the uh, country uh, as the big box giant and other retailers brace for a tougher year ahead. Um, this is kind of seeing what the Fed has is, is wanted a little bit, right? Like lowering employment. Now, employment numbers are still pretty strong, um, but you can see uh, companies starting to hurt. Even companies of this kind of size are really reducing down. Um, it, it seems like in when we go a little bit later, um, when we look at some of the banks um, and kind of their acquisitions throughout 2020, it seems like across the board, everyone kind of used this, uh, I suppose, extra money that they got and, and really bloated themselves up quite a bit. Uh, I think that's the case for a lot of um, employment numbers, um, and we'll certainly see it the case uh, as the case in things like mortgage-backed securities, which we'll get to later. Uh, so Walmart's e-commerce rival, Amazon, announced 9,000 job cuts on Monday following 18,000 layoffs in January. Uh, Amazon has also uh, closed, canceled, and delayed the opening of new warehouses um, as some online sales shifted back to stores. Uh, stores. Let's see here. Yeah, so I mean, you know, not a lot of like movement here whatsoever. Let's do it on weekly. Well, let's do it this way. Let's see. So, I mean, nothing, nothing like too extreme for it. I, I think this cutting down um, of employment is going to be pretty good for the company. When, when you get to hard times, uh, it's just trimming the, you know, you're talking about people here. You know, you don't say like it this way particularly, but you, know, you got to trim down on some of the expenses essentially, right? Especially when things get a little tougher. Um, the company confirmed, this is Walmart now, the company confirmed to Reuters uh, that it is eliminating hundreds of jobs at five fulfillment centers, um, told Reuters it was reducing its workforce because of reduction or elimination in evening and weekend shifts. Um, so it's pretty, you know, it's a, big, it's a big move for them. Walmart anticipates slower sales growth and lower profits in the coming fiscal year. Uh, the company said last month that it expects same store sales for its U.S. business to grow between 2% and 2.5%. Um, that's excluding fuel. Uh, that compares to 6.6% growth in the previous fiscal year. Uh, the company expects adjusted earnings per share to range from 590 uh, to 605, again, excluding fuel, um, for the fiscal year. And that's lower than the adjusted earnings per share of 629 for the past fiscal year. Online sales have continued to grow, though at a slower pace than during the peak of the pandemic. Um, 
e-commerce sales for Walmart's U.S. business rose 12% in the most recent fiscal year, uh, which ended January 31st. Um, and that compares to 11% growth in fiscal year 2022 and 79% in 2021. Um, and other kind of like, you know, small news like this, um, Apple is getting into the movie business. Let's see where we go on here. So um, this also led to a lot of cinema stocks jumping quite a bit. Um, a Apple usually releases films uh, directly to um, different streaming platforms. Um, so it seems like they might be going for like a big box office hit now, which is, you know, um, I'm sure there's probably, I would say less fees running it like that. Um, also just expanding its market share into different kind, well, into different markets essentially, right? Um, it's a pretty good idea. Uh, cinema stocks also jumped um, Thursday after a report uh, that said Apple's plans to spend $1 billion on this. I feel bad kind of for the AMC uh, apes, as they call themselves. Um, they, yeah, I have this guy I know, um, he works at one of the restaurants I, I go to. Um, he got in AMC at, I, I don't even know, like 20 bucks or something like that. And the thing has just continued uh, uh, to lose value. It, Again, with these kind of like meme stocks, I mean, we all know this, but there's, you know, not a lot of real value in them holding them long term. I'm sure they could be vehicles for crazy gains if you time it correctly. Um, but I mean, it doesn't even seem like we had anything. You know, let's see here. I mean, how big of a move really is that? Ah. So, yeah. I mean, this is just a bad, obviously toxic stock to hold. I think these guys are really, and regardless, regardless, the um, these companies kind of jumped a little bit on that. Um, again, Amazon made a similar commitment last November, promising to make between 12 and 15 movies for the movie theaters each year. Um, Bloomberg's report indicated that Martin Scorsese's crime thriller and a bunch of other ones from Ridley Scott as well um, are on the short list for longer theatrical runs. Um, anyways, I, I think what we're seeing is kind of like a big rebound again into cinema. Um, it was weird. I, I mean, you know, I can speak a lot again for, for my age group. Uh, we going to movies was kind of not really something you did. We, we loved being able to stay in, but I think with the pandemic, um, we realized how, <laughs> you know, you don't, um, know what you have until it's gone, I suppose. Right. Um, so give me a second here. So I think we're going to see a lot of rebound in this, but uh, regarding, you know, the cinema stocks themselves, probably, probably nothing big on that. Um, when we get back, um, we'll talk a little bit about Hindenburg. Um, they released a uh, pretty scathing report on, on Block and its CEO, Jack. Um, a lot of the report itself, I, I read it all yesterday. Um, there are some things in it that are valid. I think a lot of other things kind of make it look a little bit like a hit piece. Uh, I'm not saying that's what it was, but there are qualities to it. So we'll kind of parse through uh, the positives and the negatives of that report and kind of see what happens with that. And folks, stay tuned because we'll be right back. Currencies, commodities, and bond markets are as important as ever right now with how they're driving the volatility in equity markets across the globe, which is why it's a great time to try out Teddy Kegstat's Tiger Forex report. Teddy Kegstat breaks down the Forex markets every Monday using his 30 plus years of experience as a trading veteran of futures, Forex, stocks, and options. Teddy releases his weekly Tiger Forex report every Monday morning with coverage of all the major currency pairs, including the dollar index, the euro dollar, pound dollar, dollar Swiss, dollar yen as well as many more and he also has weekly coverage of the crude oil market and the 30-year t-bonds as they both influence forex markets tremendously when you sign up for the tiger forex report you also gain instant access to teddy's 60-minute webinar archive he just hosted forex strategies and fundamentals what is behind the tiger forex report for all the details and to start your 30-day tiger forex report subscription today visit the front page of tfnn.com tfnn educating investors are you looking for a way to consistently add winning trades to your portfolio? Tom O'Brien is here to help. 
Tom O'Brien has been successfully trading markets for over 30 years. A frequent contributor to TD Ameritrade Network and CNBC, Tom O'Brien founded TFNN over 20 years ago to help educate investors just like you. Tom's daily market newsletter, Market Insights, is published every morning when the markets open to give you the competitive informational edge you need to succeed. These newsletters are packed full of Tom's advanced technical analysis and are geared to deliver comprehensive strategies for a successful portfolio. Get Tom O'Brien's newsletter, Market Insights, today and try all of our products and newsletters 30 days risk-free with our money-back guarantee at TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com, educating investors. Call now, toll free at 1-877-927-6648. Internationally at 727-873-7618. All right, folks, before cracking into the Hindenburg thing, um, something very quick. Um, I, last time I was on, I was speaking about the EVs quite a bit, right? And some of the new players into the game. Um, so what we have going on now is um, Ford says it will lose $3 billion on EVs in 2023. And this is, you know, obviously not great, but it, look at it in a way of kind of like a restructuring, right? Um this is a whole new kind of line for them. Um, I, I, and seriously, it still is kind of like a burgeoning technology. I find it a little bit ironic as well um, that this is going on now. Ford um, tried very, very hard uh, to make kind of the switch to EVs difficult in the past few years. Um, but Ford is spending a lot of money on EVs. Um, obviously, Tesla has ignited that price war in China, um, along with Volkswagen. Um, the announcement came as part of a plan today to explain to investors why Ford is changing its financial reporting structure. The gas and hybrid division is now called Ford Blue, whole new division with it, and the commercial division is Ford Pro. Um, Ford uh, reiterates a 10% margin target for company um, with the adjusted, adjusted EBIT. Um, confirm that among the new business segments, Ford Blue and Ford Pro are both solidly profitable and well precisioned for growth repeat its 8% uh, EBIT margin uh, objective by late 2026. Um, and yeah, so I mean, I, this again, I, I think it's important to <clears throat> take a little bit of patience with completely opening a whole new line of um, products. Uh, again, I think these cars look good. I still stand by kind of my general like social analysis, I suppose, on it, where I think they're good looking cars and they address um, a, a demographic that would probably buy EVs but aren't um, too keen on Teslas uh, with their looks or, or whatnot. Interesting, um, this is more with Toyota, but they have just come out with their new Prius. I'll do a quick one. Let's see if I can find it here. And honestly, it does not look bad. Let me see. All right. Okay. I mean, hey, listen, like they're really coming in the game right now. Um, the, the EVs are getting there, guys. Um, obviously, these uh, Prius have been around forever. Um, still like a low horsepower, but I mean, you can see now like the evolving market um, for, for people who want EVs. I mean, this is like a really big leap from their kind of traditional, um, you know, car with, with not a lot of aesthetic to it whatsoever. Um, anyways. 
All right, so the Hindenburg thing. Hindenburg obviously got a lot of exposure with the Adani Group um, paper that they released. Yesterday, they released a um, pretty scathing report on Block, which is Jack Dorsey's company, um, Squarespace, um, Cash App. And what I said before the break, let me see if I can pull it up. What I said before the break was that I think that some of it, while there was a lot of legitimate concerns in it, and I think those absolutely need to be looked at, and we will, um, there were some parts in it, especially in the beginning of the report, um, that kind of attacked it on a, um, on a moral basis, right? And that's an interesting, I, you know, even going through school doing financial analysis, um, we never focus that much on like what is the, I mean, of course, if the company is doing like horrible things, you just stay away from it. But one of the things they focused on was that Cash App, which is, was a major driver of revenue, uh, was featured a lot in um, rap videos and specifically a type of music called Drill. Um, this music is generally gang related. Um, and a, a lot of these songs spoke about um, doing basically illicit activities um, through Cash App. I, I took like a little time and just to look through kind of what they shared. They, they made a whole compilation, Hindenburg did, on YouTube. And honestly, it, it's kind of ridiculous. Um, and I mean that in the sense that like there are songs that are just called Cash App and it's just people essentially listing um, the crimes that they've committed. And what they were hitting on regarding that um, was kind of, you know, it wasn't that um, Cash App or Block didn't even refer, like, didn't even recognize it, um, but that Jack Dorsey actually lauded um, th these guys for, for putting it into their show, excuse me, into their music video, um, and said this shows to investors that this is a very dominant app um, just for cash in general, so it's very popular among young people. Um, Furthermore, Hindenburg reached out to a guy who directed one of the videos, and he said that um, Block actually paid them $1,000 uh, for doing this. Not for making the video itself, but just, uh, or the contents of the video, but just mentioning, mentioning it in a song. So that's kind of wild. Um, furthermore, with that, let's see, um, there, there's a big issue that they might have misrepresented user data. And that seems to be a problem with a lot of stuff on the internet. Um, there's not really a limit on uh, how many accounts. It just, you know, generally that's not kind of traditional practice in like website building is limiting how many accounts um, can exist for one person, right? And if you're not aware of that, what you can end up doing essentially is like inflating how many users you actually have. And especially if you're, as Hindenburg was kind of accusing Block of doing, um, of suggesting that every number is, is more or less a unique user, which wasn't the case. Uh, it turns out there was multiple accounts per one person. It was also discovered that um, if an account was banned um, due to something, you know, like it was associated with a crime, um, that account would be banned, but the user connected to it would not be banned. So they were able to open up uh, new accounts instantly, which is you know, again, kind of a strange practice um, for Block. I, I also think the, the, the promise like, hey, look at how much we're growing, um, when in reality these aren't really fully unique users is kind of an issue. Um, <clears throat> one thing that's interesting that Cash App is doing is a buy now, pay later. Uh, this is actually becoming really, really popular um, among the younger generations. I mean, I think even, I, I, I think it was Domino's or Papa John's that was doing a, a, a buy now, pay later for, for pizzas. You could take a loan out on the pizza. Um, which in, you, you know, I used, when I was uh, like a, probably 19, I worked in a pawn shop, right? And this is the kind of thing, you know, you pay us, you'll be fine, a small interest. If you don't pay, uh, you're gonna get charged really hard. I mean, I think, the, legally, we were limited to something like 25%, but this is, this is insane. Um, and that's just for pawn shops. It's a little bit different for other things. Um, but you're getting to a point where, like, <laughs> in the case of the pizza, like, you're buying this, and some people aren't paying, and they're, they're racking up huge amounts. Now, what, what are really, like, the legal implications? I'm not really sure regarding that, but 
for something like Afterpay, uh, which is the service's name, um, <clears throat> it's, it, it tends to be, it looks a little bit predatory. Um, so they don't charge interest, and I don't think they're really allowed to. Um, and I, I might be wrong on that, but I, I, I don't think they're allowed to, and this is like a loophole kind of thing. Um, but they, they do have um, equivalents of, of late fees, essentially, right? And uh, this can add up to like APR equivalents of something like 289%. And there are definitely more ramifications for not paying this um, than there would be for something simple, you know, uh, I don't know, like a pizza or something like that. When we get back, we'll keep going a little bit more into it. Um, we'll look at a, a little uh, comment from them. So we'll be right back. If you want to take advantage of this sector, now is the time to subscribe to my Gold Report. The Gold Report is a comprehensive look at the metal sector as well as the markets that move gold, which is the currency and bond markets. New subscribers get a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have nothing to lose. Every Monday morning, I publish the Gold Report with coverage of gold, silver, bonds, the XAU, HUI, GDX, as well as more than 30 different mining equities. To see for yourself the types of profitable trades that are recommended within the Gold Report, sign up now by visiting TFNN.com. Don't miss out on the next great gold trade. Sign up today. Sharpening your skills as an investor is like getting better at playing a musical instrument. You have to practice, sure, but you also need excellent instruction from experts. At TFNN, you'll get advice and guidance from the authority in technical market analysis. And it's not just dry, tedious text either. TFNN airs live financial content streamed live on TFNN.com and TFNN's YouTube channel with Tiger TV. Live every market day from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern. For free, each host is an experienced trader and gives their take on the market while taking calls and questions live from around the world. From the moment the market opens until the closing bell sounds, Tiger TV has eight different shows with expert hosts to help you make the right moves with your money. Watch online at TFNN.com or on TFNN's YouTube channel and become the investor you were born to be. TFNN, educating investors. TFNN has just launched their new trading room, The Tiger's Den, hosted at Discord. TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. And now they are expanding their reach with The Tiger's Den, available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. In The Tiger's Den, you can look over the shoulders of Tom O'Brien and the other TFNN hosts while they analyze charts during their live Tiger TV programs and join an interactive trading community with hundreds of members exchanging ideas. Interact with other Tigers and Tigresses as they share trading ideas, news analysis, and discuss the market action all trading day, even at night and on the weekends. The Tiger's Den at Discord is accessible on mobile or tablets as well, so it's always at your reach. To sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders, just visit the front page of TF. This segment is brought to you by Think or Swim. For more information, just click the Think or Swim banner on the front page of TFNN.com. Okay, so yeah, going back to the um, buy now, pay later. Um, Block acquired this company Afterpay, which is the basically the technical structure they're using to do this. Um, a company called Fitch Ratings reported that delinquencies through March 2022 had more than doubled to 4.1% uh, from 1.7% in June of 2021. Now, this is for um, January of last year. This is for last year. Um, but you can see, like, this is an increase. Um, I... <laughs> this is kind of what I'm saying. Like, how do you even, like, begin to enforce this? Like, what is... I, I don't use this at all, um, a buy now, pay later, that's just not a great idea for, for me. Um, but I'm not sure what kind of collateral they have whatsoever. Um, and I mean that for, for Block, obviously, um, if, if people just decide to say like, no. And again, I'm not, this doesn't affect your credit at all. Uh, that's the whole thing that Block kind of goes with, which is like, listen, we're not a bank, we're not dealing with credit scores. Like, 
just take this and go. And uh, there are a lot of these smaller companies that were opening up, um, you know, kind of a year after uh, quarantine. And I haven't heard much from them at all. Um, so, yeah, I, I think this is kind of bad news for them in that capacity. And I, I think, uh, you know, if wages actually do decrease at some point in the future, like the Fed wants, um, and then credit lines also shore up, which is, you know, something that Powell brought up. Um, I, I think like buy now, pay laters will be huge, but what is the delinquency rate on that going to be when more and more people are using it when they're in a tighter, tighter financial situation? Um, another thing they have is 31%. This is for Cash App in particular, but a 31% of their revenue comes from instant deposits. Um, this is not, and what that is, is like if someone sends you money, right? If you want to take it out of your account and put it into your bank account, um, there's usually a, a wait time, something like three days, or you could pay a small fee uh, and get it immediately. Uh, that's 31% of their revenue, um, but this isn't even like competitive for them. And I, what, what I mean by that is that other companies that do the same thing charge less. Uh, Cash App is actually like at the top of it, along with Venmo and PayPal. Um, Apple Pay is only a 1.5% fee. Uh, blocking Cash App is 1.75%. Um, Bank of America is 0%, obviously along with Bank of America, Zelle, which they acquired is 0%, which is just a phenomenal, I use Zelle all the time. Chase One, I mean, you get the idea, right? Um, so it's just not even competitive, like, in there. I think there's, like, some exceptions where you'll get kind of, like, more of, like, a floating fee. Um, but, you know, whenever I pull out, I'm getting charged something like that. Um... So yeah, I mean, they, they got drilled on here. This, what it says here is on a fundamental basis, even before factoring in the findings, uh, there's a downside of 65% to 75%. Um, Block reported 1% year over year revenue decline and a uh, gap loss of 540 million in 2022. The other weird, I mean, CEOs do this, so it's not, you know, it's not uncommon, but you know, Dorsey really cashed out um, at the top of this, um, all of their guys did. Um, I don't think that's them necessarily saying, hey, this company's going down. I think that's, again, one of the, kind of the weird misrep misrepresentations, but one of the weird things that Hindenburg kind of threw into this. Um, I mean, obviously, like, when everything was at its height, guys were cashing out of it because it's, you know, how much higher does this go? Um, let's see. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's what's going on with Square. I would definitely recommend you guys go, I, Hindenburg has it on their Twitter, and just kind of read through it. Um, it was definitely interesting to kind of see what's going on with that. I'm not an investor in Block whatsoever. Um, I, still, I still use Cash App, but that's in lieu of other things, like if a vendor doesn't use Zelle or something like that. All right, so the banks, kind of the, the big talk recently. I thought this was really funny. I, someone sent me this this morning. This is from January 24th, 2022. The European banks ace the, the U.S. Fed's stress test, showing strong capital levels. Uh, that's obviously Credit Suisse. Um, you know, what can you really, like, say regarding this? Um, I know for, like, the smaller banks, something like SVB or First Republic, um, some of the rollbacks on the, the Dodd-Frank Act made it so they weren't getting stress tested as, as heavily. Um, but, uh, for something like this, I, I can't really understand, you know, so many things had to go wrong. If this is like, you know, an accurate kind of assessment that they did, so many things had to go wrong for something like Credit Suisse. And Credit Suisse has been on the decline for forever. Um, obviously Deutsche Bank is getting hit today. You know, is that from there actually being issues with Deutsche Bank or is it more from like just a general aversion that the market is having for this, for the finances right now? Uh, I'm sure we'll kind of like see that, um, but certainly I just I just found this kind of uh, funny to read. Um, to dive in a little bit, you know what happened with with SVB um, is they kind of just screwed up their risk maintenance. Um, in banking, you have you know kind of long term assets um, and shorter term liabilities, um, but you want to structure it in a way that those are 
that discrepancy becomes a little bit more equal. Um, you essentially your assets and your liabilities have to be at a similar duration, so you so you know you kind of ladder maturities and stuff. Um, SVB didn't do that. Uh, they had long-term T-bills, which are safe, um, but what happens is when you get stressed, um, i.e. like a bank run, and your liabilities kind of come up, um, and you're in a market where you have increasing interest rates, so therefore the assets that you're balancing that against are now depreciating in value, you get obviously a very, very bad time. Um, Signature obviously went under. First Republic is struggling. That has been such a wild ride. And I mean, like one day it'd be great news. I mean, you can see <laughs> you can see this little bounce up here. This was after markets. Um, and then just a real steady decline. Um, you had it where, okay, everything's good. Uh, everything's going to be backed. And then you had it, well, it seems that um, the CEOs and the C-suite executives sold out about here, and that made everyone nervous, and some more good news came, and then it went up again, and then we had Yellen say that, well, maybe not everything's going to be backed in a blanket sense. And this is, this, uh, you know, holders of this stock, I just feel bad for them, especially guys who are taking the gamble kind of in this lower area. That's a rough, that's a rough feeling for sure. Um, let's see. I'm going to pull this up for you real quick. Obviously, Tom spoke yesterday um, about a lot of these regional banks holding um, a ton of commercial-backed, um, commercial mortgage-backed securities. Um, and I was reading this um, report earlier, and it was interesting, and it was kind of talking about like the, the issue we might get into. Um, let's see. Yahoo had a uh, kind of a headline that it was saying that this report says that 1.7 trillion exist in unrealized losses. Um, so what's essentially happening? This report was going over why you know these things are invested in um, mortgage-backed securities. So what happened, as it's saying, um, was during. Oh, we got the break coming up. We come back. We'll talk a little bit more, like what happened in the inflation of mortgage-backed security number-wise in bank holdings, and kind of what the raising rates themselves, just like with, with the treasury, treasuries, um, what that kind of says, and if this could be kind of a toxic thing uh, for banks as a whole. Uh, guys, stay tuned. We will be right back. If you're looking for potential trading setups in the stock market, then Rocket Equities and Options Report is a newsletter you should try. Tommy O'Brien delivers options and equity trades when the markets present them using a combination of fundamentals and technicals. Sign up for Rocket Equities and Options Report today with a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. For all the details and to start your subscription today, visit the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Biotech is booming, but for how long? Whether you think the biotech bull has room to run or has run its course, trade LABU or LABD. Direction's daily S&P Biotech three times bull and bear ETFs. Visit directioninvestments.com slash biotech today. 
An investor should consider the investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses of the direction shares carefully before investing. The prospectus and summary prospectus contain this and other information about direction shares. To obtain a prospectus or summary prospectus, please contact direction shares at 866-476-7523. The prospectus or summary prospectus should be read carefully before investing. An investment in the funds is subject to risk, including the possible loss of principal. The funds are designed to be utilized only by sophisticated investors, such as traders and active investors. Distributor Foresight Fund Services, LLC. TFNN has launched the Tiger's Den, hosted at Discord. TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. The Tiger's Den, available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. Sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders. Just visit the front page of TFNN.com. This program is brought to you by Vista Gold, traded on the NYSE American and TSX under the symbol VGZ. I'm O'Brien. All right, guys. So what we're looking at here um, is the total deposits of the U.S. banking sector from 2019 until 2022. It's from Fred. Um, so you see, like, a, I mean, five billion increase almost. Um, this is with such low Fed funds rate here. So this is, again, obviously showing increase in deposits. And then what we see from here now in order to kind of, you know, balance out the asset, excuse me, the liabilities here, the deposits, the banks started investing in mortgage-backed securities. Um, and this, you know, is a pretty equal kind of increase. Um, ratio wise. So what is what is the problem here essentially? So the as it stated in this paper is like the interest rate risk of MVS are very large. Um, and again, this is true for all long term um, like fixed rate assets basically. Um, so it points out here it says the average duration of bank securities is about about 5.7 years. Um, the loss from an increase in interest rate uh, can be computed as the duration uh, then times the change in interest rate. So they took the period from January 2022 to now, and that was an increase about 2.5%. And kind of a quick calculation on that uh, means the value of the securities holdings will fall by around 14.25%. Uh, uh, banks' total security holdings, um, again, made mainly agency-backed, mortgage-backed securities, and treasuries uh, stood at 5.5 trillion in December uh, 2022. So this implies that securities have lost approximately 780 billion. Um, this is slightly larger than the FDIC's estimated, uh, excuse me, estimate of banks unrealized losses on securities uh, at last year's year end, <clears throat> which was at 620 billion. Um, and it says, regardless, these uh, are large losses equivalent to 28% to 36% of uh, total bank equity. So, you know, what, what happens, I mean, obviously they're going to hold these things to maturity, right? In a, in a natural setting, this would be okay. They don't have to cover their liabilities quickly. Um, but if you get things that start occurring, like what you saw with SVB, you know, your traditional bank runs, um, you could be in a major problem here. Now, hopefully, there's a bit more risk, risk maintenance uh, within the sector itself, and it's it's not kind of like a, you know, bad standard that they're doing right now. Um, but with, with things with what Yellen said the other day, which just increases fear uh, for the banking sector um, entirely. I mean, on these smaller banks, you could see runs occur, and it's interesting in the sense that you know. One of the things I read, and I'm setting this up, one of the things that I read was that the market is now starting to price in, I saw this on like Reddit, um, the market is starting to price in, um, decre not decrease in interest rates, but no longer uh, an environment where interest rates will be increasing. And I, I don't know what people kind of misunderstood about that. And I, what I mean is what Powell was saying was that we won't increase rates anymore um, if the credit lines shore up. Right. 
And so if the banks keep operating the way that they had been, rates are definitely going to keep increasing. What the whole bet is itself still is that this this market has to has to contract. Um, so, you know, what is that? What does that look like? Like if if banks, uh, if those credit lines do start shoring up and I mean, what's going to happen is you're going to see more closures of these smaller kind of banks in the in the worst case scenario, right? Or a a worst case scenario. Um, however, what I think's you know that, that's something that, that's something to look at. Um, I think what's interesting though too, kind of like in this realm, is that the the stronger like more like capital, um, you know, like highly capitalized firms, I guess, um, they're still kind of floundering, not floundering, but not really moving um, much at all. Um, Bank of America obviously is a bit, you know, not as large as JP Morgan or anything like that, but you would expect like in a interest rate rising environments, you know, banks tend to do very well because they just get more return. Um, oh, this is Boeing I'm looking at, that's awesome. Give me a second. Let's see here. Ah, that was my issue. And this is obviously a one year, one day. Let's maybe go to a six month or something. You're still seeing this downward trajectory. And I, I think that this might be a little bit irrational um, and what I mean by that is I think these institutions with a lot of, I don't want to say irrational because a lot of people actually are moving their money out of banks and that's a smart thing to do and into like money market funds. Um, but I, I think that it not being a little bit more robust equity wise, equity price wise might be um, a miscalculation in the, in the market itself. Um, if it does turn out that these smaller banks do collapse, I think these larger institutions, especially like JPM, uh, will be fine. However, there, like I was just saying, there is a massive movement out of banks um, into money market funds, um, which is traditionally what happens. Uh, let's see. Um, if I could have some figures for you regarding that. So yeah, um, this, and this is actually an analysis done by Bank of America. Um, <clears throat> the assets under management for money, uh, money funds uh, has now exceeded, <clears throat> excuse me, 5.1 trillion, um, up over 300 billion over the past four weeks. Uh, they also counted the biggest weekly flows to cash since March 2020, uh, which is the biggest six week inflow to treasuries ever and the largest weekly outflow from investment grade bonds since October 2022. <clears throat> Now this here says the next bubble, you know, we'll see what happens with that. But this is kind of just a visualization of what's occurring with that. Um, again, like money that's not going to be insured and, you know, um, moving into money market funds just kind of have better returns, especially in this time. I, I just I just do think there is room after a little bit of dust has settled that these larger finances um, will be a be a good uh, investment choice, at least. Um, so we just kind of have to wait to see what happens regarding that. Um, in the realm of metals, um, well, actually here, let's do this first. Um, just another kind of interesting thing. Um, and this is going back to what was going with, uh, going on with commercial backed, um, co uh, excuse me, commercialized mortgage backed securities. Um, the office REITs are down 30 to 50%. Um, and so stocks like BXP, SLG, let's pull a few of these up, are just de uh, descending. And really, like again, like the, the problem, the, the guy who was even writing about this in, in a forum online was like, I, I don't get it. Like, why is, this, why is this happening? And it's like, well, occupancy for these spaces is like 40, 60 percent. And, and that's, that's like down from 99 percent pre-COVID. Um, I think like it, I'm, I'm curious as to why the, the people thought that the commercialized ones would rebound. Um, the work from home had been a push uh, for quite a while. Um, and the world essentially gave people the, the means to do it. So many things are hybrid now. I'm working from home and I'll go in two days a week. 
you're gonna see a big surge in essentially like shared space, shared office space. Um, and those are the ones to really look for going uh, into the, the future. Uh, guys, we'll be right back, hang tight. Are you looking for a way to consistently add winning trades to your portfolio? Tom O'Brien is here to help. Tom O'Brien has been successfully trading markets for over 30 years. A frequent contributor to TD Ameritrade Network and CNBC, Tom O'Brien founded TFNN over 20 years ago to help educate investors just like you. Tom's daily market newsletter, Market Insights, is published every morning when the markets open to give you the competitive informational edge you need to succeed. These newsletters are packed full of Tom's advanced technical analysis and are geared to deliver comprehensive strategies for a successful portfolio. Get Tom O'Brien's newsletter, Market Insights, today and try all of our products and newsletters 30 days risk-free with our money-back guarantee at TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com, educating investors. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com and hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com and hit Watch Tiger TV. All right, so to wrap up the show, um, you know, I've mentioned a lot of times I, I traded Steel Dynamics um, for a while and I still hold a little bit. Um, there was, there is some talk that steel really might uh, kind of take off in the future. Um, I obviously spoke, I think maybe two shows ago, um, about a new bill um, that said, uh, you know, using if you're going to build infrastructure or kind of anything in the U.S., you need to use raw materials coming from the U.S. And this is really bullish on steel. Um, this particular um, article is from Cleveland. Cliffs, and it's speaking about uh, the U.S. auto demand and how this is backing steel quite a bit. Um, so Cleveland, uh, Cleveland Cliffs expects to ship around 16 million um, uh, in 2023, up from 14.8 million in uh, 2022. A bullish demand tailwinds. Um, their CEO said the full year shipment target uh, was achievable as the company has now completed the most major equipment maintenance. Okay. Um, Conclaves, which is their CEO, said about uh, 5 million uh, will be supplied directly to steel consumers and about 2 million of additional automotive steel will be shipped uh, to service centers and other processors. Um, yeah, in Cleveland in November, Cliffs announced um, a $50 per unit price increase 
to its sheets products as domestic steel prices were descending to a year-to-date low. Um, with the Platt's TSI U.S. Hot Rolled Coil Index um, in Indiana falling to six, uh, 620 from 1500. Let's before this ends, let's take a quick look at Steel Dynamics on the trade. This is oh, let's see here. This is really re peeled down a little bit. Uh, this might just be like a general kind of like market reaction itself. Um, but it, it'll, it'll pay to see to kind of track these guys. Um, this is about to test its, uh, it did test its day with volume almost. And it did reject, but on low volume. Um, so we might get a retest again. Um, and we just, you know, see what goes on when that happens. And quickly, we'll just take a look at new core. If I can spell the ticker correctly. Very similar moves all the way through. Guys, listen, thank you so much for joining me. Um, it was awesome, and uh, stay tuned for next week. Building 